Greetings, family. Welcome to AR Network. With me today is Dr. Ronoko Rashidi, and he will be taking us on a journey uh, to the, through the door of no return, right there on the continent of Africa. Welcome, Dr. Ronoko. Well, thank you very much for having me, my sister. Yes. It's always great yes. to be on your show, even though today's presentation is not going to be a fun one, but it's a necessary one so that we appreciate what our ancestors went through and the price that they paid for us to be here today and to redeem them. So we have a short time to show a bunch of photographs. I'm going to take you to, I think, eight of these places. I call them places of memory and places of horror. Five will be in West Africa, um, because a great percentage of the sisters and brothers who are in the Western Hemisphere, from St. Martin and Jamaica to the United States, came from there. I'll show you one from North Africa, another from East Africa, and then one that might surprise you. So let's begin with the photographs. Now, I suppose the first question would be, <clears throat> What is the door of no return and what do we mean by that? The door of no return is a kind of a, a name that we use today. I doubt if it was used in ancient times. I mean, not ancient times, but when the uh, slave trade was in full bloom, was the last place that you would, how do I put it, um, be in Africa. You were kept for hundreds of years our ancestors were hunted like animals and captured, not slaves, but men and women and children and husbands and wives and sons and daughters and accountants and lawyers and farmers and merchants. So these were not slaves, these were human beings, our ancestors who were hunted and captured deep in some cases in the interior of Africa and marched to the coast. And the coast was where the dungeons were. Some people call them castles. I would never use that word. That's where the dungeons were. And this is where our ancestors were kept in holding pens until <clears throat> they were put on the floating coffins called slave ships and taken to the Western Hemisphere. Okay. So each one had a door of no return. This is the, the, the door you would enter as you were taken out of the dungeons and put on the ships. And here I am uh, a number of years ago with this young sister uh, in <clears throat> front of one of those areas. This is just in front of the door of no return. And this is either in Elmina or Cape Coast dungeon in Ghana. Elmina and Cape Coast were two of the biggest dungeons. Some of them were relatively small and by relatively perhaps only taking a few thousand people out. Some of them were big, and Almina and Cape Coast were two of the biggest. And here's the courtyard of one of those dungeons. Each one of them had a church, you know, where the uh, slave owners or the people who ran the operation would worship, and there would be dungeons for the men, there would be dungeons for the women, and in one case, at least one case, there was a dungeon, a holding pen for children. And we're going to visit that in just a moment. These are not fun places. Now, the first one that I want to take you to, so people not only see the door of no return, but they put it in context, which I think is very important, is actually not a dungeon at all. It's more like a fortress. There were fortresses. In some cases, there were fortresses that were used to protect the dungeons because you have different competing European powers. You have the, the French, the Portuguese, the British in particular, but you also have the Danes. I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out. The Dutch were actively involved in the shipping. I think they built a lot of the ships and captained many of the ships. And then the Spanish weren't so much involved in this end, they were on the receiving end. So this one takes us to a country in West Africa called Benin, at one time known as uh, Dahomey. 
and there is a fortress here called Wida, as you can see. And this is the entrance to Wida, and this is the um, the main structure in um, in Wida, in that part of the world. That reminds me of so Judah. <laughs> That ah, reminds me of Judah, the word Weda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it may have similar roots. I wouldn't be surprised. And then, of course, you can see how it's spelled here. So you have the Dutch, I'm sorry, not the Dutch in this case, but the French, and I'm sure before the French, and perhaps at the same time, the Portuguese. Portuguese were the first big Western European slavers, the Portuguese. And uh, a huge segment of our sisters and brothers, as you know, our ancestors were taken ultimately to Angola. I'm sorry, not Angola, but to Brazil, the, big, the only Portuguese speaking country in the Western Hemisphere. Now let's stay in Benin for a moment or two. And this um, sculpture stands at the spot of what was known as the tree of forgetfulness. The captured Africans in this case would be awakened in the middle of the night so that they were not prepared for resistance. That was always the key. Even with <laughs> the door of no return is to minimize resistance. At any rate, they would be awakened in the middle of the night. And unlike some of the places, Wida is not exactly on the ocean itself. It's a bit inland, about five or seven miles. So the captives would be taken and marched to the sea and they would march around what was called the tree of forgetfulness. That was supposed to make you forget your past life and accept you for the life of a slave. And that's what this spot is. And then a little further along is something equally infamous, frightening, called the House of Darkness. And the House of Darkness, apparently you can see it behind these trees, is also where the captives were kept for a period of time. And you can see the wall in front of it, and it's marked by these um, commemorations artistically. This is the tree of forgetfulness. Apparently you had one for, according to this, one for men and one for women. And then you can see the captives being examined. It doesn't take much to imagine the humiliation and degradation in addition to everything else that our ancestors endured. Marching around the tree of forgetfulness with the shackles and stocks around their necks. Here were instruments. Uh, you know, in an earlier presentation, I said instruments of torture, but I don't think so. These were primarily just used to keep the captives in check. And these are heavy. I don't know if anybody's ever lifted or even seen one of these manacles or these, these chains. They're very heavy. So you couldn't get very far. And then you'd be chained together. And they are on a ship. And apparently, there is an uprising here. That's one of the things that we need to emphasize a lot more, the resistance to enslavement. That these sisters and brothers fought back. We don't want to minimize the suffering of our ancestors but we did more than suffer. An uprising aboard a ship. So also I'd like to see more research done on <clears throat> those Africans, those native Africans who attacked those, dungeon, those dungeons and fortresses in Africa itself where the door of no return was. This one appears to show Africans aboard a ship being tossed off the ship. And I don't know if that was because it, there was a storm or what the situation was. At a certain point in time, when the British abolished the transatlantic slave trade itself. Now, they didn't abolish slavery, but they abolished the slave trade. That means that if you were on a ship, if you had a slave ship, a floating coffin, and um, you were on your way from West Africa or Central Africa to the Americas, and that ship would be seen by a British cruiser, that was a punishable crime. And so in order to eliminate that crime, you would get rid of the evidence. So Africans were actually thrown overboard. And right at the House of Darkness, 
are two, in fact, several interesting monuments that commemorate uh, sisters and brothers who have uh, recorded these things and written about it, some of the more recent scholars and activists. For example, this is Walter Rodney from Guyana in the, um, South America, the Caribbean, who wrote the book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. If you want to understand how Africa is in the situation it's in, that's a great book. And then here you have some of Africa's heroes and sheroes, those at home and those abroad. On the bottom is Harriet Tubman. And this is either, I believe, Jean-Jacques Dessalines or Toussaint Louverture of Haiti. This looks like, I could be wrong, one of these, look, this looks like Marcus Garvey and W.B. Du Bois and Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. Let me move on because I have a lot to share. And then as you walk a little further, you get to a memorial, a monument that's designed to commemorate um, those Africans who were taken away and to pay homage to them. And one of the ironic things about all of this is that a lot of these places are physically very, very beautiful. And it kind of belies the horrific history that is, is associated with it. But look at the blue skies and the Atlantic Ocean is just on the other side of those trees. And if you want a detail, you can see it a little closer here. The enslaved Africans with uh, their hands behind their back and another detail. And not far from there is a statue of the Haitian patriot, Toussaint Overture. Apparently he was born in this community. And then we can move to another country and that is, this country is called Gambia. Gambia is a small country, really an enclave of Senegal. The uh, Gambians and Senegalese are essentially the same people. It's just that the French carved out a big chunk and the British carved out a smaller chunk so that they would have access to the sea. The Gambia has developed significance in recent times because it's considered to be the birthplace of the uh, man who wrote the book Roots, Alex Haley. And his ancestor was Kunta Kinta. He is believed to have come from this very dungeon. And this is at a place called Fort James. And this is in the Gambia. This is an island. Um, it's a frightening place to be. Nobody lives there. All there is are the dungeons. And you can see what's called the slave yard, where the Africans were gathered. A door of no return might well have been inside here. And I've been here, I think maybe four times, and it's never pleasant. Now, if it's unpleasant to me and you, imagine what it was like to our ancestors who endured it. And so when we talk about the door of no return, these are the images that come to mind. Now we're in Ghana itself. And not only do African Americans and various groups of Africans, I'm sure from Jamaica, other parts of the Americas, St. Martin, they go there but local people go there too, especially school children, because it's important to them or for them to know this history as well. And this is a photograph I took of a bunch of schoolboys getting ready to go in the dungeon several years ago. And you can see the pensive look on their faces, the anxiety. So imagine what it was like when you were captured and you were going in there and you were seeing it for the first time. Before you got there, and this is what we do with my tours, we um, start from as far north as possible, and we follow the route that the captured Africans were forced to march along. And at this place, you have what the local people call a slave river or ancestral river park. And here the captured Africans, bruised and battered and traumatized, were able to take a last bath before they were marched to the dungeons. And there you can see the river that they immersed themselves in. And even there, they had their shackles and chains on their hands and their feet. The last bath. Now, this is, I believe, Cape Coast Dungeon. Remember, there are two big ones in Ghana. Ghana had a bunch. But there are two big ones that are still open to the public. One is called Cape Coast Dungeon, and the other is Elmina. Um, President and Michelle Obama actually visited these a few years ago, and their children. And this I haven't is what, seen the, the river. I haven't seen the river itself. I don't know. Oh, yes, there it is. Okay. You have, you have some technical problems on your end. It's telling me that your bandwidth is low. This is the floor of one of the dungeons. 
and this is actually the dungeon itself. This is one of a, uh, the larger ones. And then you can see on top these cannons. And this was used not uh, for Africans, not to uh, attack or suppress Africans, but to uh, defend themselves against the other European slave trading nations. So all along the coast, you might have a Dutch dungeon, uh, French, Portuguese, British, etc., And you have fortresses used to protect the dungeons. Here you have a female slave dungeon. And then here's the actual door of no return. And then on the other side is what's called the door of return. And this is something quite recently. You see, when we were taken out of that door, uh, the assumption would be that that was it. And now you have <clears throat> African-Americans and other diasporan Africans from the Caribbean, from South America, from Canada, going back. And that is kind of like a miracle. In fact, a lot of this doesn't even have to be narrated. A colleague of mine, according to the story, would take groups in these dungeons and then <clears throat> have uh, the doors closed after they went inside when all the lights off. There's no electricity, there's no running water, there's no toilets, there's no trash chutes, there are none of those things. Now here's another group. And I put this photograph in here quite deliberately just to show the interaction between sisters and brothers on the continent and sisters and brothers coming home. There's a fiction that Africans don't like us. They don't identify with us. They're not friendly. I found my experience to be just the opposite of that. These are local Ghanaian schoolgirls. Here's a, a fortress not far from there that was also used as a dungeon. And this is Fort Amsterdam. And across from Elmina, Cape Coast Dungeon, you can also see, in this case, Cape uh, Elmina Dungeon in Ghana, you can see another fortress. This is called Fort Jago. And this was used to protect the dungeon itself. It was very, slave trading was very, very profitable. And that's the sad part about it, that the Africans were dehumanized for profit. They were turned from people into commodities and merchandise and chattel. And these are all from Fort Amsterdam and Fort Patience. And they were always built <clears throat> in strategic areas, generally high up. You can see the sign, slave exit to waiting boats inside one of the dungeons. This was the water supply. And these are cannonballs <clears throat> in the courtyard of Cape Coast Dungeon. And women who refused to be raped were chained to these cannonballs in the hot sun to melt their resistance. Very, very cruel. There's the door of no return. Now this one, as we start to wind down, takes us to Senegal. And this is an infant's dungeon. This is in Gori Island. The local people call this Slave Island. And there was a dungeon for the men, a separate dungeon for the women, but there was also a dungeon for the children. Imagine that, a children's dungeon. Who could be so cruel as to enslave a child? This is on Gory Island, Senegal. And then quickly we go to uh, another West African country and that is called Togo. This is the entrance to, it says here, the House of Slaves, but the original name was the House of Wood because apparently it was owned by the Wood family. And it was transformed into what we now call the House of Slaves. And this is what it looks like. And the captives were kept underneath. In fact, let me show you uh, how that was done. This is one of the members of my tour group going underneath the house. And it was a small space. You couldn't stand up. There was not enough room. You, so you couldn't stand up. And all of this was designed to minimize resistance. 
So you can see one of my folk going down underneath it. And then right in front of the house, the porch, the Africans, the captured Africans were kept underneath there. This is the current caretaker, along with one of my colleagues, a good brother named Vernon Bornique, who has loaned me some of the photographs that I'm using today. And one of the children who live in this area and the look on his face, I think pretty much tells the story. These are all from Togo. And then we leave North Africa, I'm sorry, we leave West Africa and we go to North Africa and we are now in the country of Tunisia in the South. And this is a slave quarters called Kebele. Here Africans were kept after being marched from as far West as Mali and Senegal. And they might've been sold to Europeans or Arabs or who knows. This is also largely abandoned. It's kind of like a ghost town. To me, when I go to these places, it's like you can feel the spirit of our ancestors. In a case like this, when I went, <clears throat> no dogs were barking, no birds were chirping. Every now and then you could see the rustle, you could, uh, the wind would rustle these date palms. This is Kebele. So as I pointed out, these are places of horror, places of memory, the door of no return. Now I want to show you, all from Kebele, I want to show you one more in Africa and one outside of Africa. And we'll say we did our job. This one takes us to Zanzibar. And Zanzibar is, is an island off the east coast of Tanzania and Southeast Africa. And here the British and the Arabs from the country of Oman competed in terms of slave trading and the capture of our ancestors. Eventually in June, 1873, the British abolished it, abolished the East African slave trade. Africans had been captured from uh, Ethiopia, from Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Uganda, Congo, Malawi, Zambia, and captured here on this island that prevented escape. So eventually the British abolished it in June 1873, but the Arabs from Oman thought it was very, very profitable. So let me take you to one of those dungeons, in fact, several of those dungeons, but this is a memorial. I think a Swedish uh, woman put this together to the enslaved Africans on that site. So right next to the church was the auction block and the marketplace. And right next to that were two dungeons, in fact, probably several, but these are the two that have survived and I'm gonna take you there. But you can see the chains around their neck and one person is not chained. He would have been a kind of an overseer and so we get to, at some point in time, the terrible, uh, the sensitive topic of African involvement in the enslavement of other Africans. That's not a pleasant subject. Now here you have the so-called slave monuments. There's a church and then walking into the dungeon itself. You go downstairs and this is where our ancestors were kept. You can see the door, the window, that would have been the only source of light, no toilets. Um, there would be one room for the men and one room for the women. As I understand it, each room could accommodate about 40 people each. And that's just hard stone. Lay on it, sleep on it, sit on it. The chains are still there. And you can see what it says during the slave trade, these two underground rooms were used to keep slaves before being taken to the market for auctioning. A small hut was on top and there was a big hole used as an entrance to the slave chamber. Slaves were kept in terrible conditions. So many died of suffocation and starvation. The amount was terrible. Now in Zanzibar also a little far away, a little bit further away, right on the ocean, there's another place where our ancestors were kept, in fact, several places. In memory of the slaves after the abolition in 1873, in these deep, dark holes like this one, 
these coral caves our ancestors were kept. And finally, they would be marched to the sea. And this would be their door of no return. Actually, just a narrow passage in these massive rocks. And you would be lowered down there to the ships that awaited you. Here's yet another. I didn't even want to go down there. My colleague went. And you can see, I'm looking down at it. Um, it's a very frightening place. Marching to the sea and being placed on the ships. And as I say, these are beautiful places. You know, what irony. Imagine all of those ships waiting to take you away. Never see home again after that. Family separated. You're going through the door of no return. And here's yet another place where the Africans were actually sold. This was the auction block. Here they were gathered before being sold. And this is in Stonetown, Zanzibar. And this is the home of, and this is his tomb of a slave catcher, a famous one named Tipu Tib. And his tomb has been uh, turned into by the local people, a trash heap. And finally, one last look out of a kind of a door of no return a kind of a, as I say, these are places of horror and memory. And I wanted to show this one because I wanted to just emphasize that our struggle is not just a local one. And our victimization was not just a local one, it was global. So here we go to Australia. Australia was a British prison settlement. And in this prison settlement, there were areas where the most rebellious of the black people were concentrated. And one of those places was called Palm Island. And this is kind of like an early concentration camp. And I was able to visit it several years ago. These are some of the people there. You have to take a ferry. It's across, uh, it's in Northern Queensland. Some of the people. And the last photograph I wanted to show you was also in, is also in Australia, but a little bit different and this is in the place called Tasmania. Yes, there really is a place called Tasmania. Um, maybe the worst of them all, because in mainland Australia, the prisoners, the thieves, and other um, convicts were taken. But in Tasmania, the murderers from England, from English prisons were relocated. And their bloodlust was let loose on these, on the sisters and brothers who lived there, who had lived there for thousands of years. And the last of the full blood Aboriginal Tasmanians were kept here. The last full blood died in 1876. And this again is kind of a, a concentration camp that fits in well with our notion, or at least my notion of the door of no return and what our ancestors endured. And the sign says it all our future generation will save our nation, Black history. So it's very important that we know about this. It's not fun, it's not pleasant, but if our ancestors could endure it, then we have the responsibility to at least tell that story and honor them so that this will never happen again. And this is what I wanted to share with you, my sister. Thank you so much. Words cannot express the journey. I can see you're affected. And that is as it should be. Everybody experiences these differently. Some people scream and holler, some people cry, some people pray. But again, it's not something that we can allow ourselves and the world to forget. So it was an honor to be able to share it with you. And I look forward to coming back again and talking about more aspects of our history that we seldom get to really share with each other. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And as you leave, uh, it reminds me that it was the door of no return, but now we are preparing to return. Many have exactly. gone back to many of these countries on the continent.
In fact, I take a group back, God willing, this year, maybe two groups. Let me just leave my contact information. A person can always email me at renoco at hotmail.com, R-U-N-O-K-O at hotmail.com. Or go to my website, drrenoco.com, or go to Eventbrite and just type in Renoco for all my upcoming webinars. My sister, God bless you. Keep up bless the good you. work. Please stay in touch. Thank you. One love, one love. One love.